My name is Jeff Chang. I've uh, been in computational medicine here for the last few years. Um, I've recently joined the neurosurgery department. I have a background in psychology and cognitive science, actually, and then moved into machine learning for uh, healthcare. And so maybe as a result of that, like my, our, our work kind of lives in between uh, computational and, and clinical work. We're interested in um, not only developing but applying machine learning approaches so that they can be used in the clinic or in active research projects. Um, and so we'll develop and adapt techniques as necessary. So basically today I'm going to be talking about kind of the story of a collaboration that we have with ophthalmology to il illustrate that some of the application of some more canonical and maybe some newer techniques in machine learning research um, and some downstream applications that really can impact clinical outcomes and you know, active, act active research out there. And so sometimes I'll, I'll present this to clinicians as well, and I can't figure out how to introduce big data and AI, so I just stopped doing it. Um, the, but what I wanted to highlight here is that there's, there's a fundamental disconnect between uh, canonical you know, AI and machine learning and active biomedical research. And what I mean by that is that when we think you know, big data and AI, we're thinking about a well-defined problem. We have a massive amount of data. We have well-defined input well-defined well task or targets, and we can you know, fine-tune or develop these algorithms to try to predict our, uh, our output given our inputs. Uh, on the flip side, biomedical research is concerned with discovery. Um, you know, we, given a few cases that we've observed of a new disease, we want to figure out what's, what's driving this. Um, so as a result, you know, a lot of the, the AI, for health, uh, AI for Health kind of advances are, are developed and applied to kind of well-established phenomena um, from a clinician's perspective that these are a little bit more uninteresting. So the question that I'm trying to get at here is how can we increase the synergy between modern uh, machine learning and biomedical research and keeping our clinician collaborators happy? And so I'm going to talk about this in the context of age-related macular degeneration. Um, this is a degenerative disease that uh, occurs in the back of the eye. It is the leading cause of blindness for the elderly in the United States. And basically what's happening during this disease is that the photoreceptor cells in the back of your eye that allow you to see, they basically start dying. Um, this disease currently is irreversible. Uh, some interventions exist to uh, kind of slow the progression of this disease. Uh, there are some newly very recently FDA approved um, other interventions. And um, current research efforts in the ophthalmology space are actually still ongoing to try to characterize the trajectory of this disease and identify high risk biomarkers. And so the re part of the reason that uh, characterizing this disease has taken so long, even though it affects so many people, is that it had primarily been um, diagnosed using fundus imaging, which many of you might be familiar with. This is basically just a photograph of the back of your eye. So when you go in to see your optometrist and they shine a giant light in your eye, uh, this is what they're taking. And one with uh, age-related macular degeneration, might, you might be able to see some atrophy in this, in this image. It turns out that if you can see atrophy in the fundus image, it's probably too late. The, the vision loss that you've already, you're already experiencing is irreversible. Um, and in the last decade, there's been a lot of progress um, where the field of ophthalmology has adopted OCT imaging. Uh, you can think of it kind of as a 3D imaging modality for the back of the eye. So think, you know, an MRI for the eye or something like that for, for our purposes. And what it allows you to see is that um, the lesions that we, that it, canonically you would find in the fundus image are actually, you know, um, they, there's depth to these, which you are now visible using OCT imaging. And so machine learning has been, so obviously, you know, uh, machine learning has been applied to predict AMD. Um, so there's a, there's a few high profile papers that have, have uh, tried to do this. But um, from a clinical standpoint, these haven't been uh, very useful. And part of the reason for that is these two images that I'm showing. So advanced AMD, or uh, uh, this, this kind of top row over here. Can you see my mouse, by the way? Oh, you can. Excellent. Um, 
you can tell that this looks extremely different from, uh, from a normal image here. And you know, we can, you can construct a large database of, of a bunch of patients that have you know, advanced AMD and normal patients because we have kind of, maybe, maybe these are automatically annotated by taking um, codes from the electronic health record or something. But again, you know, these codes were generated because they were diagnosed using the fundus image, which really only captures kind of advanced stage of disease. Uh, in parallel, kind of what's been happening in the opth opth ophthalmology space, I can't say the, uh, the ophthalmic space there, that's what it is. Uh, they're, they're focused on trying to characterize, you know, earlier markers or high risk biomarkers of, of uh, progression. And, uh, and really, this has been brought about by the adoption of OCD imaging, which is now standard. Um, this has been going on in the last, you know, five years or so, and so then um, the name of the game becomes becomes early detection. Can we try to identify these high-risk biomarkers rather than in rather than trying to identify if the disease is already there or not? Um, that's what I just said. Right. Okay. So these are just an example of you know a couple different. Uh, lesions that we might be looking for. OK, so this brings us to problem number one. Um, these, we were, with our collaborators, we were presented with you know, one of the largest data sets that they could assemble. Um, this was, uh, so this, uh, let's see, there are some other details that I'll skip over in the interest of time. But basically, you know, we had on the order of 2,000 samples with you know, these lesions occurring at different prevalences, what have you. Um, compare that with uh, the other applications of machine learning to the same, um, to the same um, task. So uh, let me back up a step. So the, there we go. So the, the clinical biomarkers had been validated on 138 patients, which you know, we had an ophthalmologist going through image by image, saying yes or no, the biomarkers here. Uh, they've gone through and generated one of 2,000 volumes, while kind of the, the previous ML um, studies had used orders of magnitude more data. And so what can we do about this? Um, acquire more data. At, you know, when, when we first met these collaborators and we're kind of talking about what to do, we can't really ask them, can you acquire you know, 10,000 more images? Um, we could try you know, data augmentation techniques. Uh, and then the other is a technique called transfer learning, which I'll talk about a little bit. And so I'll just kind of gloss over this because many of us are familiar with transfer learning, but basically the, the intuition behind it is that you know, uh, a neural network doesn't need to start, or a human doesn't need to start from scratch when learning how to recognize a new disease. Um, the idea behind transfer learning is try to imbue this ability onto neural networks, have it be able to do some sort of task, and then take that ability and transfer it over to a new task. And so basically the idea is we don't want these networks to start from random. Um, another uh, issue at the time of this, this model was developed probably four, four years ago or something like that. <clears throat> Only 2D OCT slices were available rather than 3D volumes, which, are, which were what we were given. So we had to kind of tweak a design and tweak a neural network architecture to recapture this, uh, this information. Essentially what we did was we took you know, our stack of OCT slices, we stacked them into you know, a tile, a very long two-dimensional image, and then used another piece of the network to uh, integrate the volumetric information back together. Recently, we've replaced that one DCNN to integrate the information with a transformer. It turns out it does a little better. Um, but basically, you know, we, we took this approach to try to identify these high-risk biomarkers um, indi that, that indicate progression to AMD. Lo and behold, it works. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about it. Um, so what we, what we find here is our approach, was, which was called Slivernet. Um, because we were able to incorporate external data via transfer learning, uh, outperformed you know other other techniques, and it turns out that you know we were 
we were able to, and so we uh, tried to figure out, you know, just how few data could we use to, to reach the level of performance that we did um, just by kind of randomly, you know, taking, um, taking samples away from our training sets. So, so what, I guess, from the, uh, from the clinician's perspective? Um, how, how good is this model? Uh, we had, we applied this to an external data set and had, you know, both our model try to identify these high-risk biomarkers and we had clinicians do the same thing. These were uh, junior retina fellows, so there's still, you know, specialists. And it turns out that, you know, our model was, perf was identifying these biomarkers kind of on par-ish with, uh, with, with these um, clinicians. And it turns out that uh, the errors of the model, or at least the, when the model got it very wrong or the model was very confused, these cases tended to correlate with uh, either mislabeled cases or cases where multiple graders might disagree on what exactly is the lesion going on in this image. So that was encouraging. Uh, we, we took this um, as a positive sign and kind of tried to figure out what can we do now that we can identify these uh, high-risk biomarkers, you know, somewhat reliably. And so the, the first thing that we tried to do was try to answer the original question, can we predict based on these high-risk biomarkers, is one going to develop AMD in the future? The answer is that uh, sort of it improves upon the ability of previously known risk factors to predict if one is going to develop the disease or not. Um, but maybe more interestingly, um, what we're, we're taking, we're, we're exploring this idea of kind of machine phenotyping, where um, since this disease is still under active study, uh, there are other, you know, subcategories of, of disease progression, and we can very quickly train a model to identify this stage of disease, and then go back to, you know, our data archives and just try to generate, and try to identify who has the stage that we didn't know to look for when we actually saw this patient. And it turns out that you know this this type of atrophy that we're looking at here, um, we pulled a bunch of patients who had a code for AMD, a health record code for AMD, but and tried to figure out, or we applied our model to identify this type of atrophy, and it turns out that. Uh, our model thinks that a bunch of patients did not receive a code for, for this type of atrophy. Um, right. And, you know, this, this becomes significant because this particular type of atrophy is the kind that the recently, approved, recently FDA approved drug acts on. So, you know, we can, we can start doing things like this. We can go back and try to um, phenotype data at scale. Another thing that we might be able to do is try to um, assist in recruitment for clinical trials. So what we're looking at here are two different high-risk biomarkers. Um, we know that they tend to occur together, but in some cases, you know, patients might have one biomarker and not the other, uh, or vice versa. And again, this, is, this was uh, to assist with some of our collaborators who were recruiting for a clinical trial who really needed, you know, this biomarker, but not this one. Um, so is, is that it? Uh, did we, did we kind of solve this? No, not exactly. Uh, it turns out that, you know, for, for a bunch of reasons, and, and, some, and we've been talking about this uh, earlier today as well, um, yes, transfer learning provides a mechanism, but, uh, you know, this depends on a large annotated source network if we want to use a supervised um, source network. Um, and what we, sh what we found here was that, you know, the, the source data set is extremely important for the performance of the model. Uh, but we, you know, you, you end up with a chicken and egg problem where now, now you need to find another source data set. So instead, what we might be able to do is explore um, self-supervised pre-training methods. Uh, basically, these, uh, these methods, and there are a number of them, they encourage representation learning by, uh, by just kind of performing some sort of arbitrary task. Uh, for example, figuring out, like trying to predict the type of transformation that you made to an image, trying to predict the image itself, 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about contrastive learning here, um, or you know, predicting some other augmentation of the image. And so, contrastive learning is one is an interesting one that uh, that we're going to be looking into. The basic idea behind contrastive learning is that we want yes. So, in your previous slide, are you using the patches or the three uh, images here for the big contrast? Uh, we are using the three D images. Like two, <laughs> it's not really it's not really scalable at the moment. So, so we're still trying to figure it out. Compare it against uh, two D images and see how what's the performance improvement over using the three D. Yeah, we should. That's that's something that we're probably that will be that will be looking into for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a great point that's a caveat that you know i didn't think to put in the limitations but you know these things get very big uh the so contrastive learning essentially what uh this what the task is here is to encourage um is to build a model that basically learns to represent transformations of an image uh, if they're transformations of the same image, they should look like each other. So if I take a dog and I just look at its face or look at its legs, um, it should still know that this comes from a dog versus you know, the chair in this case. If it's different views of a chair should look, like, should look like each other, and the different views of the chair and the different views of the dog should not look like each other. And that's enforced by, by this, uh, this loss function here. Um, this has been shown, you know, to uh, to perform on par with, you know, fully supervised transfer learning, uh, with you know certain conditions met. So we're looking into the potential of uh, applying this to medical data. Turns out that a lot of this has been done, um, or a lot of this not done. This has been tried. There have been many contrastive learning applications to healthcare. Um, what you're looking at the pl this plot is. Sorry, this blue, all of these blue points here are different papers that have applied contrastive learning to try to pre-train networks for uh, downstream tasks, downstream classification tasks. And the majority of them have been applied to you know, chest x-ray and you know, 2D, 2D data sets, um, possibly for this reason. And I wish I could tell you that we had results in the ophthalmology space on kind of these kind of these smaller problems, but you know those are still a work in progress. So you know the next time I'm here, we'll talk about those. Uh, I did want to kind of caution uh, about the the contrastive learning and procedure and kind of the and kind of general directions that we're going to look at what are the best kinds of augmentations in the medical image space. As you can see here, maybe uh, if we want to randomly remove patches of the image, that might not be as big of an issue in the natural image space, but it might be an enormous issue in the uh, medical image space. Um, but uh, stay, stay tuned for that. Um, so just to summarize, you know, there's, a, there's a disconnect between canonical AI and machine learning and active biomedical research. Transfer learning offers a solution, um, so this can be directly applied to do things like, you know, uh, machine-based phenotyping. We can do the obvious kind of diagnostics, prognostic things like that, and then also uh, semi and self-supervised learning approaches can allow these uh, source networks to be developed on unlabeled and kind of more niche data sets. And so I'll close here. Thank you to uh, to our friends at Doheny Eye Institute who. Uh, who we work with closely on this project, and our folks at UCLA Computational Medicine who also performed this. Thank you. <laughs>